Hello, hello, welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a great lunch. You're all nourished, you're all good, because you're gonna need that energy. Who is inspired by this morning's sessions? Hands up. Yes, unbelievable sessions this morning. You thought they were good? We're only just getting started. Our first speaker this afternoon is a real game changer. She is a woman who started up her business to reverse poverty by connecting very low-income people to, to cutting-edge technology, social enterprise models with AI and machine learning, as well as freelancing and clean skincare. Lots of different things there, but it's now grown into a movement around impact sourcing. That's urging individuals and companies to contribute to alleviating global poverty by changing their sourcing strategy. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Lila Jana, founder and CEO of SemaSource, Summer School, and LuxMe. Good afternoon. So I have the um, relatively difficult job of talking to you about poverty after lunch. So please bear with me. Um, and I hope that I leave you with some thoughts about how you might implement impact sourcing locally in this region. So I'm going to tell you about uh, our philosophy at SamaSource and LuxMe which is about giving work. So if there's one takeaway from my remarks today, you have it here on the first slide, it's give work. That we have a different way of thinking about uh, opportunity and about solving this awful problem of global poverty. So why should we care about global poverty to begin with? We have about a billion people around the world living on less than a dollar a day. And that number is already adjusted for purchasing power. So that's what a dollar would buy you in a typical Western city in modern times. And this is why we see such tragic outcomes of poverty. It's why 300,000 women are still dying each year um, because of giving birth or, or uh, around the time of giving birth. The World Health Organization estimates that over 90% of these deaths are preventable and solely due to poverty. Extreme poverty is the reason why we have close to a billion people living without access to clean water and over two billion people who are living without access to basic sanitation and toilets. And to put this in more human terms, this is a young man who until very recently was living uh, below the poverty line. His name is Ken Kihara, and that's his daughter Rosalind with him. This is a photo I took about four years ago in Mathare slum. And it was especially disturbing to take this photo because Ken was supposed to represent a path out of poverty. Believe it or not, he had managed to get into one of Kenya's top boarding schools and graduate with honors, despite having grown up in the slum. Now, you would think that this would be wonderful news and that this would mean that Ken would be forever uh, leaving poverty behind. But unfortunately, unemployment rates, especially among youth in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, are sky high. In Kenya, about 70% of youth are unemployed, which means that even after graduating from high school, Ken was forced to move back to Mathare, to the slum, and do informal work to make a living. So those billion people that I mentioned who are earning a dollar a day, well, what are they doing? Often people think that low-income folks who are earning at this level are not doing much, but that's totally untrue. These billion people earning a dollar a day are actually working full-time, and they're often doing back-breaking work in the informal sector, where they're not even recognized as workers or subject to local labor laws. That's what Ken, who had a high school education, who could speak the Queen's English, was forced to do. He went back to Mathare slum, and he started picking up trash from this river, Mathari River, and selling it to the local recycler for about a dollar a day. To supplement his income, he started brewing a local kind of moonshine called Chang'a, which they brew in the slum. And he said they sell it to local kids who drink it to forget themselves. 
This is not a photograph from 1954. This is a photograph from four years ago. This is happening today on our watch. And it's something that is entirely fixable. Poverty is entirely fixable within our lifetimes. But it's going to take a change in the way that we deal with it. Now, the traditional model of addressing problems like what I just told you about is through aid and charity. And in the West, this really got started, believe it or not, with the US sending food aid to Europe after World War II. Many people don't realize this, but the term care package actually comes from an NGO called CARE, which was set up when Americans wanted to send food aid to relatives and people who were uh, victims of World War II. So they sent these wonderful packages uh, across the sea, and they were meant as just a temporary stopgap, a temporary solution uh, to the problem of poverty, which uh, in Europe was, was rampant right after the war ended. It was never meant to be a long-term solution. It was just meant to help people get back on their feet. But that initial model ended up getting extended. And so over the last 60 years, the Western world has now sent over a trillion dollars to sub-Saharan Africa. And yet we've not seen a rise in the incomes of the poorest people. We still see real incomes stagnant for people like Ken. Now we have to ask ourselves, why has this happened? And what do we need to do differently to ensure a different outcome? Well, overwhelmingly, the evidence shows us that the best way to address poverty is, shockingly, this is probably no surprise to you all here at an entrepreneurship conference, but it's to increase the incomes of the poorest people. When low-income people receive a boost in income, they spend it on exactly the right things, the things that we would want to see from the best development program. And this is especially true, the data shows us, when you give the money to women. Women reinvest 90% of their paychecks into the health and well-being of their families and communities. So there is no better aid program than increasing the incomes of the world's poorest women. Now, what's the best way to help people increase their income? Well, you can give them cash directly through a handout. This is a model that is now called direct cash transfers because we in the development world need to have fancy terms for everything, but it's essentially a cash handout. But an even better solution is to give work. Because when we give work, we provide not only income, but skill building, a pathway out of poverty in the long run, and a number of other benefits. Think about this for one moment. If you are running a very low-income country, think about where the budget to operate your country comes from. In many cases, the majority of your revenues come from outside of your country. They come from foreign donors. And so at the end of the day, who are you accountable to? Your own people or to the donors who are funding your country's budget? Well, unfortunately, we see so often that it's the latter. So one of the best ways to start rebuilding that social contract between people and government is to boost the incomes of the poorest people. They start becoming formalized, they start paying taxes, and they start demanding accountability from their government. Now, we know that that model is far from perfect, but it certainly creates a stronger relationship between people and government, and at least a semblance of accountability. And this is often overlooked when we think about aid programs. Now, it's 2018, and I'm going to tell you about an entirely new way of giving work that simply didn't exist 15 or 20 years ago. When you hear about the internet rolling out across sub-Saharan Africa, I want you to have this image in your mind, because this is literally what it looks like. This is a picture from 2012 of a spool of fiber optic cable. We took this photograph in northern Uganda, believe it or not. This is a region mostly known in the rest of the world uh, for a really horrific war that took place there, where children were abducted and turned into child soldiers. Um, and it was a terrible war that was waged uh, by a warlord named Joseph Kony. That, unfortunately, is the prevailing narrative that we have about this region. But many people don't realize that northern Uganda now has high-speed internet at very low cost, thanks to this fiber optic cable. Over 10,000 miles of fiber optic cable have been laid across East Africa, meaning that for the first time, 
young people like Ken can work in the digital economy. This is a fundamentally exciting move because it means that for the first time in history, where Ken happened to be born does not have to dictate his economic fate. That we can decouple this accident of geography from someone's economic future. This is the power of digital work. To give you an example of what kind of work I'm talking about, this is a photograph of a typical highway in the United States. And this is an annotated version of this photograph. Does anyone have an idea what this might be used for? Anyone? OK, I can't hear, <laughs> I can't hear that well, <laughs> but I'll tell you. This is training data for autonomous vehicle software. This is the kind of data that is being used to teach cars to drive. And there is a need for massive amounts of this training data to teach the artificial intelligence algorithms of the future. Computers learn the same way that humans learn, through pattern recognition. And so we have a need, as we are starting to automate processes from self-driving cars to facial recognition software on your phones to all kinds of automation, right? AI is penetrating every industry. And the way we train AI is through massive amounts of this kind of precisely labeled data. Well, guess who's now online who can now create this kind of training data? You can see where I'm going with this. 10 years ago, I decided to quit my job as a management consultant and pursue what I knew was my passion. I had gone to Africa when I was 17 and worked as an English teacher for low-income students in rural Ghana in West Africa. And it was there that I saw this overwhelming talent that was being overlooked. Our traditional approach to youth in Africa was to give people handouts, was to say, oh, how sad you're living in poverty. Uh, it was not engaging with the local community as if they were equals. And it was not really empowering people uh, to contribute their full capabilities to the global economy. So I thought, what if we could create digital jobs in these regions? What if we could empower people with work rather than handouts? My students in Ghana were so bright. They could name US senators probably more effectively than many Americans can. They listened to Voice of America and BBC Radio. They were incredibly bright, and it was heartbreaking to see that they had no access to work opportunities outside their own region. Well, now the world has shifted. And so I started Samasource. Sama means equal in Sanskrit, to create digital work opportunities for low-income people around the world, with a focus on youth and women. And I wanted to start in East Africa, because at the time, the region was just coming online. They were just getting access to high-speed internet. And there were all of these young people, just like Ken, who were desperate to prove themselves in the global economy. We started with very humble beginnings, with just four computers. And fast forward to today, we're now uh, 2,000 people strong. <laughs> Thank you. And we built up a really successful business doing training data for many Silicon Valley companies. And what's most exciting is that we can run this model in a big city like Nairobi in Kenya, and we can also run it in a rural community like Gulu. This is what our first super center looked like in Gulu. We set it up inside 12 shipping containers, which had solar panels on the roof. And we've been able to create employment for over 500 people in the local community. We're now the largest technology employer in northern Uganda. We, we may also be the only technology employer in northern Uganda, to be fair. Uh, but it's, it's really exciting to see this uh, change. And what I'm most thrilled about is that we're not just providing any jobs. We're deliberately going out and recruiting people from low-income backgrounds and we're paying them living wages to show that you can build a social enterprise, you can build a company with a strong social mission and still attract great customers. There's this perception that if you have a social mission, you're maybe a softy, you're not a real business person. I can't tell you how many patronizing remarks we've heard <laughs> along those lines. You can build a real scalable business with a mission at its core. And I'll just show you some data. So on average, our workers start out at below the poverty line of $2.50 a day. That's the international poverty line. 
So they're earning about $2.20 a day in their household, which means they're living in informal settlements, slums, or rural areas. It means they have very poor access to good food. We have a picture of sugar cubes here because we did surveys of our incoming agent population in Nairobi and found that many of them were eating sugar cane as a primary source of calories because they couldn't afford anything higher quality. Living at this level means that you have access to very limited education. Even if school is technically free, as it is in Kenya, you still have to pay for uniforms and books and transportation, and very importantly, the opportunity cost of going to school and not working, which is crippling for many families. And lastly, you have no access to health insurance, which means that one catastrophic health event can bankrupt your entire extended family. On average, we move our Sama Source agents, this number is actually incorrect, to over $10 a day, moving them into the middle class in Kenya. They may not seem like much, but in the regions in which we operate, this puts you squarely in the middle class. It means you can afford decent housing. This is a photograph of Martha, one of our first agents in Nairobi, in her first apartment that she bought, or that she uh, rented after she started working at Sama. We literally see the diets, thank you, of our agents change. We see them start eating healthy food. They start literally consuming fruits and vegetables and higher quality protein. And we actually offer three meals a day at our centers. We see them access higher education. Many of them are saving for school fees for younger children in the family or saving to go to university themselves. And lastly, they get health insurance, which can mean literally the difference between life and death for them and their families. So this is a huge difference, and we've now been able to do this for over 45,000 people since we started over the last 10 years. Now, I'm going to tell you about a model that could be applicable in other regions of the world. We often get asked, what could we do to build a Sama Source Center in our community? How could we apply this model of what we call impact sourcing to a new region? And so, uh, several years ago, in 2012, we decided to pilot a program in the United States that was focused on a slightly different problem. Unemployment in many developed markets is fueled by the fact that the economy has shifted towards freelancing. In fact, in the US, 94% of all employment growth that we've seen has been outside of traditional nine to five jobs and in this new world of independent work or gig work. So these are platforms like Uber and Lyft. We have a platform called care.com where you can be a remote care worker. All right, sorry, uh, you, you're an in-person care worker, but you can find the work remotely. So babysitting and elder care, house cleaning, these types of jobs. And contrary to a lot of thinking, these jobs can be great opportunities for low-income people or people who are re-entering the workforce because they can often pay higher than minimum wage and they can often give people access to a faster career path because they start earning an online reputation, right? They start getting rated by these platforms, which means that for the first time, instead of the traditional problem in the informal labor market where you show up to work every day and no one knows how well you did because you're not ranked and that doesn't show up on any sort of LinkedIn profile, you actually get the benefit of an online reputation. We looked around at job training programs in the US and we realized that none of the government funded programs were teaching people anything about the biggest labor shift in recent history. We were teaching people to do jobs that were going away, right? All of these traditional nine to five jobs. So we said, what if we started a training program that could teach people to be freelancers? And we launched Sama School. And our mission is to equip people to earn a living wage through independent work. We offer a 12-hour boot camp. It's designed to fit into working people's lives. So if people have a community college, they're going to school, or maybe they're taking care of children at home or elderly parents at home, they can still make time to do the course. And we see a huge benefit after this short course. Those who go on to work after our program earn more than $20 an hour, which is uh, substantially above the minimum wage in the US. And after five months um, after completing the program, they're able on average to earn about $9,000 in supplemental income. Now, this is a model that we're now piloting across the world. We have uh, done freelancing training now with Syrian migrants in the Middle East. 
We've done freelancing training in Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya, which has a mostly Somali refugee population, and it's really unfortunate. These many people are actually born in the camp. They go to high school in the camp, and there's absolutely no jobs for them to do. I think one of the most important things we have to tackle in the refugee and migrant crisis is how we can get work to all of these qualified people who are stuck in refugee camps with absolutely nothing to do and no way to earn money for their, themselves or their families. So digital work could be a very powerful option for this community. And I think one of the most exciting things about freelancing is once you teach people how to represent themselves online, that's a portable skill. It's a skill they can take with them anywhere they might go after that. And just to give you an example, this is a, a woman named Grace Barajas, who actually served our country in the military, came back home, and then like many veterans had absolutely no way to earn a living. We have a really big problem, which is that we don't treat our veterans very well. We don't reintegrate them into the economy. Grace ended up as a single mother, and she was able to start earning over $40 an hour doing outsourced IT support work on a platform called Field Nation. Now, these types of jobs, which uh, in her case really just required a good reading and writing skills in English and good customer service and attitude, many of these jobs are invisible to people who didn't grow up looking for jobs on their phones or on the internet, right? So just the awareness that this whole new economy existed and that Grace already had the skills and qualifications she needed to do the work was a big part of the training and transformation for her. Think of how many more Graces there might be who are stuck at home, who are unable to work outside the home, or who are unable to travel to work, as in the case of many migrants and refugees who could benefit from this model. I'm going to tell you about one last venture that I started, and then how this might relate to uh, the broader world of sourcing. So around uh, the time that I went to Gulu for the first time, I came across this incredible ingredient in northern Uganda called nilotica. It's a rare type of shea butter that only grows in East Africa. And I came across it right after I had just stopped uh, and bought a very expensive jar of skin cream. And ladies in the audience, you probably relate to me when I say my mother would always tell me, the only thing you should spend money on is skin cream because you only have one face. And so <laughs> I would save my money up and I would buy the most expensive cream I could afford until I started reading the ingredient label of this cream after I discovered Nilotica and started using it. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. It's, it's one ingredient. It's harvested by local women. There's an entirely fair trade model behind it. It gives work to local women in northern Uganda. And it's better than this very expensive brand name skin cream I just bought, which has all of these toxic chemicals and doesn't help any women in the supply chain. <laughs> and I started doing more research and realizing that there's a gap in the luxury market for ethically made products that are good for us and also good for the world. And there's this belief that somehow if something is good for the world, it's going to be less luxurious or less effective. And so I launched a company called Luxme, named after the Hindu goddess Lakshmi of beauty and prosperity. And Luxme became the first fair trade brand to launch at Sephora in the US. And this is exciting. <laughs> This is exciting because I think we have to work to dispel this myth that ethical products that do good for the world are not luxurious, that it's only hippies who wear Birkenstocks and light granola. By the way, I am a total hippie and I happily wear Birkenstocks, but people other than me uh, who want luxury in their lives can purchase something that's luxurious and also ethical. It's 2018 and the luxury products we buy should darn well be doing some good in the world. So that's the premise behind Luxme. And we launched it with these uh, beautiful African Ankara print designs. And we also highlight the stories of the women who do the sourcing on our website. Our mission is beauty for humanity. And we want to tell the story of impact sourcing and bring the luxury industry into a new standard of transparency around sourcing practices. Now, how does this relate to the broader world and to maybe your business if you're thinking about how, how you might apply give work principles to your business? 
Well, this statistic shocked me. I wrote a book last year called Give Work. You can find it on Amazon. And um, one of the things I learned in the process of writing this book was that the biggest lever we have to address poverty in the world isn't charity or philanthropy or global aid budgets, but it's the money that we spend in the corporate supply chain. The biggest 2,000 companies in the world spend $12 trillion annually on their supply chain, on goods and services, on everything from the rugs you're purchasing in the conference room to the coffee that you have in the break room to the minerals that are sourced for the batteries in your devices. Now, imagine if we could direct even 1% of this amount of capital to impact sourcing, to suppliers that do ethical things, that hire low-income people, that pay them living wages, that promote environmental conservation, right? There is a whole new generation of suppliers that are building businesses with a social impact core. And if we can direct our corporate budgets and even our personal and household budgets to those types of companies, we can have a much greater impact on the world than just through charity alone. To give you an idea of the different numbers I'm talking about, I mentioned 12 trillion is the budget that's spent by the biggest 2,000 companies in the world on goods and services. By comparison, the entire GDP of Sub-Saharan Africa is around 1.8 trillion. And the entire global aid budget is under $50 billion per year. So this is where we have the biggest power to change things. It's time to get rid of that old mentality of doing good happens through charity and philanthropy, and the job of corporations is to maximize profit. That's really not true, right? We know that so many people, millennial consumers, want to see corporations actually put their money where their mouth is and do good. In fact, nine out of 10 millennial consumers are willing to switch brands to one associated with a good cause. And the consumers now are savvier, right? They know the difference between just PR and marketing fluff and real impact. And we're starting to see a huge increase in the rise uh, or increase in the number of impact brands. So I encourage you to think about this. Think about how you might apply give work principles to your own venture or if you're starting something or want to start something, that from the get-go, you think about giving work as a primary strategy. And you can learn more at givework.org. I'm going to end here with a story of what happened to Ken Kihara. We last left him in Mathare with his beautiful daughter, Roslyn. Well, Ken got a job at Samasource as a data entry agent a couple of years ago. He very quickly rose up through the ranks, and he has now become our top global trainer. He's trained over 500 youth from Mathare and Kibera slums to do work with Samasource. And even more excitingly, I caught up with him last year in Beirut, of all places, where Ken was leading our global training effort to teach Syrian migrants how to do freelance work. It was his first ever international plane trip and his first visit outside of Kenya and he was so excited to be able to spread the knowledge of this around the world. This story is what's possible when we look at Ken as an equal, when we see him as capable of contributing his skills in the global economy rather than a passive uh, recipient of our charity or a handout. This is what's possible when we give work. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. I can see a lot more of you have snuck in while Lila is speaking. Inspirational stuff. Any questions for Lila? We do have microphones if you have a question for her. Any questions? This gentleman here in the front. Can we get a microphone? Are we running around with a microphone? Yep. One's coming to you now. It's right here. Just here in the front. Thank you. Thank you for the speech. Uh, my name is Dr. Sahab. I'm from Saudi Arabia, an angel investor. But I have a question. Uh, in Africa, how does the NGOs and governments help you in, in progressing your work? 
Any, any issues, any problems there? Yeah, great Thank question. You. Actually, um, I've been very impressed uh, with the Kenyan government in particular. They, um, they just brought on the former head of Google East Africa to be the IT minister. The country just banned plastic bags this summer and conservation is incredibly important. They're doing a lot of really progressive things. And I think a lot of people have this idea of uh, African government that's very monolithic. But in fact, many regions are doing different things. In Rwanda, uh, Kagame's government, he's attracted some criticism, but uh, he's done a lot to open the country up to entrepreneurship and, and foreign investment and to digitize uh, the whole country. So I think East Africa, especially for me personally, is a very exciting place to work. And the pace of business is exciting. People do business on WhatsApp. They don't wait for emails. Um, and then on the NGO front, we've seen a lot of interesting movement in social enterprise. I think a lot of traditional NGOs are realizing that the best way forward to help these communities is actually to provide opportunity rather than handouts. And so many of them are embarking on job training, on figuring out how they can build a social enterprise model, like if they want to address sanitation, they're helping people create businesses to build toilets locally themselves and, and turn it into a business. So I think, um, I think that whole perception is really shifting and it's an exciting part of the world to be in. The growth rate in Kenya, just to give you an example, is around 6%, which is triple that of the United States. So it's, um, at least from my perspective, it feels like business is happening much faster than it is back home in San Francisco. Any other questions? One over Thank here. You. Hello, um, Salman Ghassan from Saudi Arabia. Um, the element of having the freedom to work, um, or, 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 or the, let me rephrase it. So the element of, uh, of having a, free, of, uh, a freelance job is not to be in a traditional job, which is eight to five, right? Um, we have this issue in Saudi where we have a lot of youngsters that they're not very interested to get into these nine to five jobs. Um, obviously, it's not the same case in the Africa. Africa, there are other motives and, and elements that we need to take into consideration. My, point, my, my question is, do you think there is a solution that we can implement and learn from your experience and implement in Saudi that would uh, help those youngsters get into the work first, be productive, but at the same time have their own uh, freedom to be creative and to do whatever that they're interested in? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and it's a question that a lot of regions are facing now, right, is how do we provide employment to the youth population that's coming out of secondary school and there's maybe not enough traditional jobs to absorb them. And I think a big part of the puzzle is uh, professionalizing freelance work because we still don't treat this as, real, as a real job, right? We say, oh, go get a real job, but actually many people are earning a full-time living doing freelance work. In the US, just this year, uh, our Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is the group that measures you know, um, labor data, it released its first ever study on the freelance economy. Now this has been going on for a decade, and there are now more than 30 million Americans in the freelance economy, and we only just now started counting them. So I think government needs to take it much more seriously, as seriously as young people are, and invest in training people. Because if you're gonna make money as a freelancer, you have to know how to save, you have to know how to manage your finances, because the income can be bursty, right? One month you might make a lot of money, the next month might, you might not, and so you need to know how to save for those periods. You need to know how to present yourself online effectively. Um, all kinds of skills, right? And these are skills that we don't traditionally teach people. It's not about writing a resume. It's about building your online profile professionally. And I think um, the more governments adopt that this is the new reality, the better. And lastly, um, a big challenge we're having in the US now is that our benefits programs, so health insurance, that sort of thing, are typically tied to employers in many more civilized parts of the world, you provide that to your citizens <laughs> without tying it to, to employment. The challenge is in the freelance economy, it's very difficult to see who should be responsible for things like health insurance. And so making sure that benefits are portable and can move with the worker is essential for people to actually earn a living and improve their livelihoods. Uh, mm -hmm. okay, next question. Okay. One more question up here. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mohammed, and 
I basically, I read a book by, uh, recently by Muhammad Yunus, The World of Three Zeros. Uh, the main question I have is that, uh, uh, like, what challenges did you face as a social enterprise, and why not many, I mean, companies are starting uh, based on, you know, the principles of social enterprise? I'm so glad that you've read uh, Dr. Yunus's work. In fact, his book, Banker to the Poor, was uh, reading that was one of the catalysts for me to start Samasource. And if you haven't read Dr. Yunus's work, he's the founder of the microfinance movement and the founder of Grameen Bank, um, a Bangladeshi, and a really amazing person. So he, um, he talked about, uh, you know, in his new book, how every business should really be a social enterprise. And if we build businesses that way, then we can solve problems like climate change before they become problems, right? Instead of waiting until we get rich with our co companies and then maybe we invest a little bit in charity to save the forest. <laughs> um, I, I'm really passionate about this movement and I think more and more people are realizing my home state of California right now is burning in these terrible wildfires and we know, scientists agree, that these wildfires have been worsening because of man-made climate change right, because of things that we're inflicting on the environment. If we don't do something now, there's not going to be a planet left for our children to enjoy. And that is something that deeply is concerning all of us. And, and the best power we have to do something is to change the way we run our businesses, right? Uh, because so much of, so many of these challenges that we're trying to stop through philanthropy are originating in the way we do business to begin with. So I think if you integrate social and environmental principles in your business and you start a business that has a strong aim to address a major problem, you're going to build a more sustainable business in the long run that more people are excited to work for. And I think we're seeing this. Now, even the millennial um, workforce trends show that it's very hard to retain young workers if your business doesn't have a mission associated with it. And in a more and more competitive labor market, I think that's a, you know, it can be a value add, an advantage as an employer to have a social mission. So I think we're starting to see that it makes real business sense to do the right thing from the outset. Thank you so much.